Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be discussing the state of relations between Britain and Israel, one that went from betrayal to a close friend and ally. This is the story of the relationship between Britain and the modern state of Israel. Warm welcome to the programme and uh, today's special guest is all the way from Sussex. He's uh, a friend of the Middle East Report. Uh, I can only describe him as the one and only uh, Hugh Kitson, mm. um, filmmaker and documentary maker extraordinaire. So uh, great to have you on the programme, Hugh. Good to be here again. And um, Hugh, is, it was good to meet you at uh, is, uh, recently at Israel's uh, 75th uh, anniversary event that was organised by the, uh, the Israeli embassy. But can you give us an update on the very important conference that uh, you attended in The Hague, um, talking about Israel in the realm of international law, sponsored by um, Andrew Tucker and The Hague Initiative? Uh, yes, that conference was actually at the end of March, and it was the third one that think had held a second one in The Hague and they held another one in Prague but I believe it was very significant because there were a number of international lawyers there and actually we filmed five interviews for Whose Land while we were there but it's looking at some of the threats that are being faced by Israel through lawfare and basically it was about the twisting of international law to try and, I'm going to use the word persecute, because that's a very uh, appropriate word, persecute Israel and to delegitimize the Jewish state. Absolutely. Uh, and Hugh, what are your thoughts on uh, Britain's historical relationship uh, with the modern state of Israel? Because, um, because all the films you made, you, you are essentially uh, uh, an expert on the years of, of the British mandate and uh, Britain's historical relationship what is with what is now the modern state of Israel? Well, I think we have to start by going back a uh, hundred years because I believe that um, the British leadership then under um, Prime Minister David Lloyd George, uh, Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, actually took a very courageous uh, step in promising to facilitate the restoration of Israel and of course, uh, Britain played the leading role. Yes, there were other nations involved. Um, uh, the Americans agreed to the Balfour Declaration, and so did a number of other nations. And after the um, uh, First World War was over, you had the Paris Peace Conference, which led to the legitimization of that in international law. A very important point there is that actually the Arab leadership at that time agreed with the, uh, the hope of the Balfour Declaration to establish a Jewish state. But first of all, it needs to be reiterated that without Britain and without those very bold steps which were enshrined in international law, both at San Remo and in the mandate, and we're just about to come up to the 100th anniversary of the implementation of the mandate in September uh, 1923. Without those bold moves, the state of Israel would not exist today. And we did have, um, we were the driving force behind that. But then sadly, with the Arab revolt and um, really Jew hatred in Islam uh, that existed at that time, uh, the, the British government capitulated and basically betrayed and reneged on uh, their le legal obligations in the mandate and that had disastrous consequences. So we just take um, just a couple of steps back from what you've just said then, um, Hugh, uh, and look at that period that, of the signing of the Balfour Declaration in uh, 1917. 
Uh, it wouldn't be possible to offer the Jewish people their own homeland had it not been for the British army and the Anzac forces that uh, liberated the Holy Land from over 400 year rule uh, by the Ottoman Turks. Um, share with the significance it was for Britain to actually have that land and that territory in order to prepare the Jewish people for, for statehood. Well, what you say is absolutely right. The Balfour Declaration would have been completely and utterly meaningless without uh, British, Australian, New Zealand, uh, South African, Indian, basically Commonwealth soldiers on the ground. And of course, they won that very significant uh, battle at Beersheba, having lost two uh, previous battles in Gaza in which many soldiers were killed. They took um, Beersheba on the 31st of October 1917 at the very moment that the War Cabinet was meeting in Whitehall to consider the final uh, wording of what became known as the Balfour Declaration. So the Balfour Declaration would have been completely meaningless without that victory and then Allenby later taking Jerusalem. I believe that was a miracle, a Absolutely. miracle of the hand of God. Amen to that, the, the providence of God. And where did it all go wrong? I mean, it, I mean, Britain's relationship started off so well, but also I think we also, within this discussion, need to bring in another two elements into this. The, the first one was being the first president of Israel's um, contribution, our Haim of Weizmann, um, in producing acetone that uh, turned the war effort in Britain's favour because Britain needed that for his ammunition. And um, the second part of this one was the huge sacrifice that was made on behalf of the British Jewish community to the British war effort, um, knowing that they were probably fighting against family members who were from Germany as well. Uh, and that of all the ethnic minorities in Britain, um, they gave more than any other ethnic group to the British war effort. Uh, and we have to acknowledge these two important factors uh, of what also helped to influence British policy in favour of establishing uh, a state of Israel in what was then kind of Ottoman territory. Yes, um, it, it is known that uh, Chaim Weizmann, he did produce acetone in the helping of uh, manufacture of gunpowder, I think it was, for, for munitions, and that certainly played a part. Uh, but also Britain had a geopolitical interests in the Middle East as well. And just coming back to, uh, I'm not so uh, familiar with uh, the Jewish contribution on the Western Front, but certainly on the Eastern Front at Gallipoli in 1915, um, there was a Jewish co uh, contingent there, and uh, quite a number of the Jewish fighting, f members of the Jewish fighting force there had actually been expelled by the Turks. 11,000 of them uh, had been expelled by the Turks from, uh, fr from the Ottoman Empire land of Israel in particular, and so they wanted to join the fight against the Germans and the Turks, and did so. So there, there was a, a very real um, uh, contribution there as well, and funnily enough, it, it was the first Jewish fighting force since the Bar Kokhba uprising of 135 to 137, no, 132 to 135 AD. So it was a very significant thing. And um, Hugh, where did it all go wrong in the 1920s? Um, because we had the, the Balfour Declaration, of course, you had the uh, Paris Peace Conference, we had the San Remo Agreement. Uh, only last year did we mark the uh, 100th anniversary of the start of the British Mandate. And of course, you talked about in this programme earlier that uh, this September represents the 100th anniversary of the implementation of the British Mandate, which was the League of Nations giving Britain its legitimate to prepare the Jewish people for self-determination. But where did it all go wrong? Well, it started very early on, sadly, because the, when Allenby took Jerusalem, a British military administration was installed, and many of those uh, who were in charge there came up from places like Cairo, and they had served in Muslim nations. And basically, you had a military administration that was 
opposed to the principle of the Balfour Declaration. They were opposed to a Jewish national home or any type of restoration because they were frightened about what might happen in the Muslim world. And so even as early as 1920, in the lead up to the, uh, to the uh, San Remo conference, you had the British military actually instigating a riot which was led by Harjamin al-Husseini, who later got appointed Mufti of Jerusalem. The British military administration was then replaced and Sir Herbert Samuel uh, was appointed High Commissioner. And really this whole incident uh, in so many respects, especially with the appointment of um, Husseini as Grand Mufti, really torpedoed the rest of the mandate. A, a precedent had been set which haunted the whole of the rest of British rule and things just deteriorated. I suppose the big, the big question um, is why did the British appoint um, the Grand Mufti uh, Al Husseini to that position, um, knowing that he was uh, a member of the newly formed uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, formed in Egypt by Al Badana, and um, they had uh, an extreme interpretation of, uh, of of Islam, very much like the uh, ISIS of today and other Islam terrorist organizations um, who completely rejected any concept of a, of a Jewish state in the land and instead yeah, used the Arab populations living there to stir the hatred against against the Jewish people. Um, you've got to ask the question of the only reason I can imagine the British doing this is that they did that in order to remain control and to break the promises made in the Balfour Declaration and San Marino to prepare the Jewish people for their own nation state and self-determination. I, 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 I don't think it was a deliberate thing. Actually, it was Sir Herbert Samuel uh, who was mainly responsible for that appointment. Now, Herbert Samuel was actually a Zionist and he had pro uh, even suggested to the British government early in the uh, Second World War, 1915, that there should be a Jewish state. So he was a Zionist, but he was, he was trying to appear even-handed and bent over backwards a little bit too far. So I think that was a genuine mistake and it was a very bad one. And if we move on to um, the 1930s, the situation gets um, a lot worse in terms of uh, British support for uh, uh, an independent Jewish state in the ancient Covenant homeland, which is uh, Israel today. Uh, essentially, as uh, we, but at the same time, we saw the Jewish agency under David Ben-Gurion effectively establish a state within a state, and Israel was built, the Jewish people were slowly building the apparatus for a state as well. Um, but, but share with us the impact of the rise of uh, Nazism and fascism across Europe um, had on the Jewish communities living under the British mandate of Palestine who realised that the, the Hitler's taking power, he's instituting, uh, instituting legislation like the Nuremberg legislation, uh, hugely anti-Semitic and of course the Jewish communities across Europe became fearful. They, they, most, certainly, they most certainly did. Um, one of the things that happened during that period was that the British government was wanting to appease the Arabs uh, simply because they were frightened that the Arabs would side with the Nazis, which they finished up doing anyway. And um, certainly Harjamin al-Husseini, uh, the Grand Mufti, he, f he finished up in, in Germany for much of the Second World War and was wanting to um, encourage Hitler, in fact they started to put plans in, in place for this, to extend the extermination of Jews right across the Middle East, including in what was then mandated Palestine. So um, Britain, I think we were misguided in doing it, yep. but we tried to appease the Arab um, revolt against any further Jewish immigration and that resulted in the White Paper of 1939. There were several steps before that, but that's what the end result was.
Yeah, I think it's also important to mention the fact that, that Hitler gave uh, uh, the Grand Mufti of former Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Al Husseini, before he was kicked out by the British, his own SS regiment was the first Muslim regiment belonging to the SS in the Balkans, um, in which he was the uh, the commander preparing to launch jihad um, against the Jews, not only in the British Mandate of Palestine, but also uh, across the Middle East. But share with us the circumstances um, that led up to one of the most disastrous foreign policy papers probably of all time, and that was the White Paper of March 1939. Well, in 37 you had the Peel Commission, which was basically rejected by both sides, and that would have been the first two-state solution. Then uh, in early 1939, the, um, the British government, uh, and it was Lord Halifax as Foreign Secretary and Malcolm MacDonald as Colonial Secretary, and of course, uh, Prime Minister um, Neville Chamberlain, who called, a, they called a conference in London. It was a large, last ditch effort really to try and get some sort of agreement between the Arabs and the Jews. And, um, you know, the Arabs actually wouldn't even sit with the Jews. So in St. James's Palace, they had these two parallel conferences going on. And that fell apart, I believe it was on the 15th of March, uh, 1939, just two months before uh, the white paper, which was dated 17th of May, I believe. 1939 um, but um, I you know I've been studying this mandate and the betrayal and so on for at least two decades and I keep coming across new material and while I was at the um, conference in The Hague a couple of months ago one of the people I interviewed was a prof professor Stephen Zipperstein who's professor of law uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, and he had made a discovery of a, uh, of a telegram, and um, we've got a little clip about that. Yeah, so here we go, an, an exclusive uh, for uh, the Middle East Report, uh, thanks to Hugh Kitson, and uh, this is Zipperstein's uh, uh, interview talking about what is known as the Polish telegrams. Um, and this is the desperate plight three million Jewish people uh, Poland were in prior to the Nazi invasion of Poland in September of 1939. 15 March 1939, Hitler marched his troops into Prague. Violating the Munich Agreement that he had just reached a few months earlier on 30 September 1938 with Prime Minister Chamberlain. Two days later, on 17 March 1939, the then largest single Jewish community in the world, the Jews of Poland, who reacted with horror to what had just happened in Prague, the Jews of Poland sent a telegram to Prime Minister Chamberlain. Telegram was sent by Agudat Israel of Poland and the United Zionist Organization of Poland. The telegram reads, on behalf of the three and a half million Jews of Poland, we appeal to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom not to slam shut the gates of Palestine. We're desperate. I found that telegram in the Prime Minister's files in the British National Archives, but I found no record whatsoever of any internal analysis or any response from the Prime Minister to the Jews of Poland. And by the time the war ended of those three and a half million Polish Jews, only about 75,000 remained and hardly any children. Uh, well, I, I don't know about you, but those uh, telegrams uh, do uh, actually bring a kind of chilling and shocking lesson from history that uh, uh, the British government at the time has got uh, Jewish blood on its hands and Britain could have done so much more to rescue uh, Poland's Jewish population and other uh, Jewish people across the continent of Europe to actually uh, flee from Nazi tyranny. Um, and we've got the evidence there, thanks to you, that, uh, you know, in a way, the 
the British government was complicit, uh, ignoring the help and the plight of, of, of the uh, Jewish population in Poland, uh, which goes to show that the British government, by being silent uh, on this issue, was actually complicit uh, with the Nazis, with the white paper that prevented uh, Jewish imp immigration into the British Mandate of Palestine when the Jewish people across Europe needed Britain's help more than at any other time in their history. Yes, and that wasn't uh, the only aspect of the 1939 white paper. Um, the British government at that time uh, decided that there would be eventually one state and that it would have a two-thirds Arab majority. So basically the whole idea of a Jewish homeland or Jewish state had been completely and utterly compromised. And it was a violation of uh, a legal obligation in international law uh, by the British government. And on another occasion, we might do something else, show another piece with Professor Zipperstein on the Anglo-American Committee of 1946, which basically um, said that the uh, 1939 white paper was illegal in international law. And, you know, I believe that the only... Britain needs to come clean about this. Absolutely. The British government today boasts of the fact that it uh, upholds international law. Well, on that occasion, it broke international law and millions of Jews, certainly hundreds of thousands who could have uh, been taken into Palestine, um, perished in the Nazi death camps. But also at the same time this was going on, you, we had the, uh, the, the, the Jews living under the British Mandate of Palestine, um, signed up with the British uh, armed forces uh, and played their part. And uh, according to the uh, newly released uh, SAS files uh, back in 20, I think 2020, um, they actually revealed that there were Jews from Palestine that went into the deserts of, uh, of North Africa um, to help the newly established SAS regiment um, take on the Nazis in guerrilla warfare. Um, so again, we, we see an incredible contribution to the war effort that is not actually acknowledged by the British government even today. Yes. About 30,000, there were about 30,000 Jewish volunteers who, uh, who fought at El Alamein and then southern Italy. I mean, two of them I knew personally. One we, uh, both of them actually, we interviewed in, in The Forsaken Promise which Revelation TV has shown on quite a number of occasions. But there were about 30,000 Jews who were then called Palestinians, and uh, there were several hundred Arabs who actually did, refused to be called Palestinians. So um, there was a very great uh, Jewish contribution at that time. I just want to draw your attention uh, to also something very, very important as well. And um, this, this took place literally uh, in July of 1944. And this is a letter sent by the chief rabbi of the UK to the uh, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, informed the War Cabinet that the chief rabbi had written to the Prime Minister to suggest that His Majesty's government should declare all Jews in enemy territory to be British protected persons says the difficulties in accepting any such proposal were, in the judgment of the Foreign Office, um, insuperable. Nor was there any reason to think that its acceptance would in any way improve the position of the Jews. The Prime Minister had been anxious, however, that the War Cabinet should be aware of the position before a negative reply was sent to the Chief Rabbi. Um, and it says here that uh, the War Cabinet... Uh, so, so we have there the Chief Rabbi of the UK asking for uh, the British government to actually recognise the Jewish people as British citizens in the hope that they wouldn't have gone to the death camps. And, and surely around this time, the chief rabbi would have been aware uh, uh, to some extent that the Holocaust was taking place. And this is why he wrote a letter to the uh, uh, British War Cabinet. I think it's shameful they did nothing about it. I mean, th although the full extent of the, of the Holocaust wasn't known, in 1944, it was known as far back, it was known about as far back as uh, 1942 
when the, uh, the, the gas chambers started to be used and the Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, Templeton I think his name was, um, he highlighted that in the House of Lords and again we had a sequence on that in the Forsaken Promise. So a full two years earlier it was known that the Germans were mass murdering Jews um, in death camps and before that firing squads uh, and so on. Uh, and do you want to sh I think it's important to also unpack probably the three worst years uh, of the British mandate from the end of the Second World War from 1945 up until 1948. Share with us the total and absolute betrayal uh, by the British government of Clement Attlee. There was a Labour government and uh, the British people, uh, oh, sorry, towards the Jewish people, particularly as we see the story of the Exodus uh, ship, the preventing of Holocaust survivors from trying to get to the British Mandate of Palestine because they felt that was the only place that would accept Jewish people, and, and how also the British Navy declared war on Holocaust survivors. Mm. Well, without going into too much detail of that, because that's a huge subject, I would like to say that I have met quite a number of Jewish people over the years who lived through that and suffered as a direct consequence of the mandate itself. And again, Britain was uh, acting illegally by keep, keeping them out. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, uh, that President Truman demanded the immediate uh, resettling of 100,000 mm -hmm. Jewish refugees from the Holocaust which of course the Atlee Bevin government refused to do point blank. But today there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Holocaust survivors who are still alive in Israel who lived through that betrayal of, uh, of the British government. And I believe that they need to be apologized to by the, by the British government. And last, two months ago, I was in Israel with a Repairing the Breach tour and we met quite a number of those uh, survivors who suffered under the British mandate. They're still there today. So let's look at, uh, at episode 12 of uh, Whose Land, produced by Hugh Kitson himself, that looks at this very important period of history known as the uh, British mandate. On the 29th of November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly resolved that British mandated Palestine should be partitioned into a Jewish state and an Arab state. Soviet Union, yes. United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstain. The Jews accepted the partition resolution. The Arabs rejected it out of hand and went to war instead. Fighting started the very next day. Many Jews died in these convoys, taking vital supplies to Jerusalem. The actual War of Independence started in May 1948. There's a document uh, by the Arab League to the United Nations saying, yes, we, we have uh, invaded this country to, to reverse something which is actually unacceptable. And so they basically went to war against the UN resolution, which is, which is quite an interesting fact, but it is a fact. General Assembly resolutions are not binding according to the UN Charter under international law. It was a recommendation. If it had been accepted by both the Jewish people and the Arab people, then a treaty would have been prepared reflecting this, this partition. That would have been binding. But those who suggest that today, whatever is being discussed in terms of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, the terms of a peace plan, that one should be uh, complying what was, with the, what was proposed in the partition resolution, disregards the fact that binding resolutions from the UN do not come from the General Assembly. Apart from the fact that binding UN resolutions do not come from the General Assembly, the Arab rejection of the partition plan effectively made it null and void. 
what UN Resolution 181 had recommended was the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states according to this map. What is interesting is that the city of Jerusalem, along with Bethlehem, was to have the status of being a corpus separatum. In other words, it was to be under international control. Jerusalem was not to be a part of the Arab state under the partition resolution. It wasn't to be in the Jewish state. It was to be set aside. An international zone was going to be created. And after 10 years, there was going to be a referendum. According to many Jewish leaders of, of, who were involved in, in the acceptance of the principles of the partition resolution, the expectation was that since there was already a Jewish majority in Jerusalem uh, in 1947, that after uh, the state, the Jewish state was created and uh, doors to further immigration were open, that there would be a significant majority of Jewish people in Jerusalem and the referendum would result in the attachment of Jerusalem to the Jewish state. That was the expectation. That expectation never came to pass because of Jordan's illegal invasion and seizure of what became known as East Jerusalem. The War of Independence continued until March 1949 when armistice agreements were signed between Israel and her enemies. More than 6,000 Israelis had been killed. That was about 1% of the whole Jewish population. 2,000 of them were survivors of the Holocaust. The 1949 armistice lines left Egypt occupying Gaza and Jordan occupying Judea and Samaria, which the Jordanian government renamed as the West Bank of the Jordan River within the Kingdom of Jordan. The Jordanian occupation also included the eastern part of Jerusalem. The armistice lines, otherwise known as the Green Line, were not to be regarded as international borders. The, the Green Line, which is simply a, a, a line on the map drawn with a green marker by Moshe Dayan uh, when he was the chief of staff in uh, 1949, when they were negotiating the uh, armistice agreements, signified the armistice line, the line where Israel's forces reached uh, on the day that the ceasefire was declared. And in the armistice agreement with Jordan, the Jordanians insisted on putting in a provision saying that the armistice demarcation line cannot under any circumstances be considered to be an international boundary. The exact language of the Israel-Jordan Armistice Agreement, for example, signed in 1949, typifies all of the Armistice Agreements. The basic purpose of the Armistice Demarcation Lines is to delineate the lines beyond which the armed forces of the respective parties shall not move, as agreed upon by the parties, without prejudice to future territorial settlements or boundary lines or to claims of either party relating thereto. And that's a little bit of a taste of what you can expect to see in the uh, forthcoming uh, documentary, Whose Land, that looks at the whole period of the British Mandate after the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel and uh, Israel's war of independence. Uh, there is so much to unpack here, but because of time, I don't think we can go into, into great detail, Hugh, but I think it's uh, important that we, we mark two important British foreign policy decisions. The first was, I think, in uh, 1948 um, to refuse to recognise uh, Israel in the United Nations as a, a UN member, uh, which was absolutely shameful. Uh, and also the other way that that the British did everything possible to hinder the, uh, the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel. Uh, of course, we saw that uh, the likes of Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, wanting to cooperate with the British, wanting to have a peaceful settlement with the British in order to bring about the state of Israel. And then you had the other 
um, ideological battle with the likes of uh, Stern Gun and the Ingram wanting to use terror against uh, British troops and against the British police uh, that were based in the British Mandate of Palestine uh, in order to force their withdrawal uh, and to accelerate the establishment, re-establishment of the modern state of Israel. And then, of course, there's the, the British became exhausted by what was happening, the incredibly bad PR from the whole Exodus ship story uh, when the plight of the uh, uh, Holocaust survivors on both the, uh, the Exodus ship uh, managed to carry international world opinion in favour of the Jewish people. So, of course, we know that the British then gave up uh, when the British mandate expired on the 14th of May 1948. David Ben-Gurion declared independence uh, 75 years ago. Um, and then we see the dreadful role that British played then during when Israel was attacked by five Arab armies. Um, having visited recently back in 2019, the Tank Museum at, um, uh, in Israel, where we're actually told by tank commanders that uh, the British had acquired the, um, the Sherman tanks from, from the Americans um, during the 1940s. And instead of letting the Jewish people get hold of those tanks, the British army deliberately drove them into the sea so they would be useless to them. Then there was the arming of uh, the Jordanians against Israel. So Britain's role uh, in helping to actually fight against the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel and decided to side with the Arabs is more shameful than the betrayal of the British mandate, is it not? I, I would go along with that because actually what, what Britain did in backing uh, an illegal in, uh, invasion of the Arabs, and I say illegal because it was, it was in contravention of Article 2 of the newly formed United Nations, and the United Nations Charter is itself uh, and binding in international law. So Britain was complicit in, uh, in an illegal act at that time. Um, one could go uh, a, a lot further than that, but uh, uh, Britain's actions during those first few years of the Jewish state, um, we've never owned up to the fact that we were acting again legal, illegally after the uh, mandate was over. Let's uh, take a look now at uh, the second part of the extract from Whose Land um, that deals with that whole period of uh, Israel's independence and its after effects. In 1949, the government of Israel officially declared the part of Jerusalem that wasn't illegally occupied by the Kingdom of Jordan to be the capital of the State of Israel. Israel's national parliament, the Knesset, was established in what became known politically as West Jerusalem. The Knesset's permanent home has been situated here since 1966. Most of the government departments are nearby, including the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Israel's Supreme Court. The official residents of both the Prime Minister and the President of Israel are also here in Jerusalem. In other words, the seat of government of the State of Israel is located here in Jerusalem and has been for around three quarters of a century. There's not really international law on capital cities per se. One might say there is a customary practice with respect to the recognition of a state's own selection of its capital city. Whether that falls under international relations or international law may be debatable. Nevertheless, it's fairly clear that countries have free reign to designate any part of their territory as their capital. And in practice, countries have their capitals at the seat of their government, and that is generally where other countries will locate their diplomatic missions so as to be in easy contact with the government of the host country. Jerusalem, it is the administrative center of the land, even when the British took over in mandate times. They knew where to put their head offices in Jerusalem. It wasn't Haifa or Tel Aviv. So naturally, it, it is the administrative center of the country. And historically, that's been the case. But it was only the Jews who made it the capital of an independent nation here in all the centuries of Jerusalem's history. 
However, the former mandatory power, Great Britain, refused to recognize it as Israel's capital. Many other nations followed suit. The fact that the Jordanian invasion and seizure of the historic Jewish capital with its holy sites was illegal under international law and a violation of the United Nations Charter was deliberately ignored. Another universal legal principle concerning Israel's borders was also ignored and still is to this day. There is a fundamental rule of customary international law that establishes the borders of newly emerging states at independence, as in Israel's case, uh, in 1948. It's universally applied in the 19th century. It was applied in South America. Uh, later, it was applied in Africa and Asia, and still later at the disintegration of the former communist federations. Uh, and really in all cases involving mandates, this was the default rule for all states emerging from these administrative areas. The universal rule for determining the borders of newly emerging states at the moment of independence dictates that a new state takes on the boundaries of the pre-existing administrative unit as its international borders. The rule is called uti possidetis juris. So Israel, as the only state to emerge from that mandate territory in 1948, automatically assumed as its uh, recognized borders the administrative lines of the mandate, and that includes East Jerusalem uh, and what was later called the West Bank, which was occupied by Jordan uh, from Israel in the 1948-49 uh, independence war. The legal status of that territory applying this universal rule is that Israel has been the sovereign since 1948. The Arab invasion of Israel in 1948 and the run-up to it had another serious consequence, which is a political hot potato today, some 70 years later, the refugee problem. In May 1948, what is happening? Well, Israel's been invaded. It's an aggressive war by the Arab state. So a war is now going on. Inevitably, when a war is being fought, you know, population often want to get out of the way. So number one is that natural desire. Who started the war? The Arabs did. So is Israel to blame for these refugees that go out? Arab refugees were created only as a result of Arab rejection of partition and especially their rejection of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land. Had the Arabs accepted partition, had they accepted the United Nations proposal to divide the land into a Jewish state and an Arab state, as it was defined, no one would have been displaced at all. Everyone would have stayed where they were. The Arabs in Palestine are being told, you can leave now, get out of the way, when, let the armies, let the Egyptian army and Jordanian army, let them do the work. And then when you come back, you can have all the properties that belong to the Jews when we wipe them out. And the Arab Higher Committee, which was the central body for the Palestinian Arabs, was making this, saying you must do it. It is true that the Israelis expelled some Arabs, but they were mainly those in frontline areas and who were known to be cooperating with the enemy. But they were only a small percentage of those Arabs who became displaced. This is only the beginning of the story concerning the Palestinian Arab refugees. And as I said earlier, the political ramifications continue to this day. In the next episode of Whose Land, we look at Israel's victory in 1967, when attacked by Egypt, Jordan and Syria. In defending itself, Israel recaptured the territory from which it was expelled in 1948 and more we examine the legal ramifications of that amazing victory. And it's so important that we uh, revisit uh, history to get the facts on the ground about what can actually happen because it means that we can develop a stronger relations both between Britain 
and Israel because that's in our strategic and spiritual interests. So if we uh, kind of move forward, um, it was on the uh, 27th of April uh, 1950, uh, 1950 that the British government um, sitting in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords formally recognised the jurisdiction of the State of Israel over its uh, sovereign territory and of course anyone uh, and we've been to the uh, the Israeli Knesset or Parliament and outside the uh, Knesset is that beautiful uh, menorah that was given on mm. behalf of the British government to the State of Israel um, and uh, that was a good thing that the British did. Do you think that the reason the British did that because they realised that the, the Cold War was starting to accelerate um, and that the Americans and the British saw that, 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 that Israel would be an ally in, in the Cold War and therefore decided to kind of uh, recognise Israel's right to exist? Yes, I'm not in, in really au fait with those details except to say that um, it was basically a socialist government. The Israeli government was a socialist government. And there was probably that concern that they may uh, side with, with the Soviet side, uh, the communists. But um, uh, since then, I do have to say that, uh, even though I do believe that an apology over the con conduct of the mandate and the betrayal after the mandate needs to be dealt with, uh, there are there are huge strides in British Israeli relationships and just earlier this year uh, well first of all there was a memorandum of understanding in November 2021 and um, uh, earlier this year there was uh, a 2030 roadmap for UK Israel bilateral relations and I do have to say that, uh, that the British government, the current British government is going a long way towards uh, trying to establish good relations with Israel. I mean it, this is a quote from the Foreign Office document. The bilateral relationship has never been stronger. Our two countries complement each other's strengths as freedom-loving, innovative and thriving democracies, Israel and the UK are proud of our deep and historic partnership. We are firm friends and, national, uh, and, and natural allies. Um, I think the fact that the British government today is trying to curb and deal with anti-Semitism, they're trying to deal with BDS, um, they understand what Israel is facing in the UN um, and especially the UN Human Rights Council and this document also goes on to talk about um, the, uh, the International Court of Justice. Uh, the United Nations has referred to the International Court of Justice on another opinion on the conflict uh, with the Palestinians and this document says uh, the ICJ referral on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict represents an inappropriate recourse to the advisory opinion mechanism as this undermines the efforts to achieve a settlement through direct negotiations between the parties. Well it certainly does that. Now this this is actually something that is going on now as we go to air and um, my hope is that the British government stand by this and actually um, put forth a representation st basically staying uh, saying what they're staying, saying in this document. Uh, Hugh, we're down to uh, five minutes of the programme, so the things I want to unpack from that, yes, we welcome uh, stronger bilateral ties between Britain and, um, uh, and Israel, of course, um, but we have to put this in the context that this wouldn't have been possible had it not been for Brexit. 
had the British people uh, not voted to leave the European Union, then we wouldn't have had that freedom to pursue closer economic and political and security ties with the modern state of Israel. But there are two things, I think three big things that, that we have to actually deal with uh, here. Um, the first thing is, like you say, the British government needs to recognize its role um, uh, and treatment of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. Uh, secondly, the British government has to repent on behalf of the British mandate and the treatment of the Jewish people. Then there's also, I think, the importance then of uh, moving our embassy as uh, Liz Truss, uh, who was uh, uh, briefly our Prime Minister for six weeks uh, back in uh, 2022, uh, uh, recommended moving the British embassy from where it is in Herzliya to, uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, and also, what we'd also like to see that would really cement that relationship would be for our new king, uh, King Charles III, to visit Israel on an official state visit. So if you add all those three things up, that would seriously enhance our relationship with the modern state of Israel. I, I believe it certainly would. Um, I'm very encouraged by this, but there are areas that the Foreign Office need to go further with. Um, one is actually recognizing Israeli sovereignty over not, not just the historic capital, which is the old city in East Jerusalem, but they don't even recognize Israeli sovereignty over what is politically um, called West Jerusalem, which is where the Knesset is, and most of the downtown Jerusalem area is. And that is one thing that they need to do. Uh, the recognition, as I understand it, at this point in time, is that Israel has de facto authority over West Jerusalem. Well, that's just not good enough. Over West Jerusalem. Over West Jerusalem. Right and of course, what is called East Jerusalem, they call uh, occupied Palestinian territory, which is absolute nonsense. There has never been a binding agreement that makes it um, Palestinian territory in the first place. And secondly, when it comes to occupation, the, the war that uh, brought this under, under um, Jordanian occupation was illegal. Britain needs to come, uh, come clean about that as well and completely recognize what happened in 1948 was illegal and make the necessary political adjustment for that. In other words, Jerusalem, as was intended in uh, San Remo and the mandate, would be the Jewish capital. They had the right to rebuild or reconstitute what had been their national home. So Britain actually really needs to go much further than this, which that in itself is encouraging, and, and recognize the truth of the matter. And it's interesting how Hungary and also Italy have uh, been talking about uh, in, in diplomatic circles about moving their embassy um, to Jerusalem. Now, it's crazy that the modern state of Israel has been in existence for over 75 years now. Um, yep. All of Israel's um, in governmental institutions are based in Jerusalem. And, and you and I have been into the, uh, the president's residence in Jerusalem. You've got the prime minister's residence in Jerusalem. Uh, you have the Knesset in Jerusalem. You have the Israeli foreign ministry that I visited as well. That's an amazing building so uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and then you have all the other, you, uh, you don't have the IDF based in Jerusalem, based in, in, in Tel Aviv. But essentially you have the whole workings of the Israeli government. Now, it seems crazy and absolutely ludicrous for our British embassy to still be based in Tel Aviv, Herzliya, uh, to make that long trip from there all the way to Israel to do business in Jerusalem. Um, and it's offensive uh, on, on behalf of, uh, uh, of our Israel, you know, because Britain's there on the behest of the British, mm. of the Israeli government. And it's offensive to the Israeli government that we have not moved our embassy. Uh, and what's gonna happen? Um, we, we heard the arguments, we can't possibly move uh, our embassy to Jerusalem because it will change the status quo in Jerusalem. This will lead to kind of riots and the Arab streets are uh, up in arms. Well, tre President Trump moved the uh, US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I don't remember any violence 
Arabs. I don't remember any kind of Arab street kicking off. I don't remember uh, the, uh, the Middle East going up in flames, or have I just been reading the wrong newspapers, Hugh? Well, you're, abs you're absolutely right. And actually, by not doing it, it's not putting the pressure on, on the PLO uh, and Palestinian Authority that needs to be put there, um, because otherwise the situation will just continue to deteriorate. So um, those two things need to happen. The embassy needs to be moved, and King Charles needs to do a proper state visit. Now, I believe that the president has extended one, and he wants to do one. So let's hope that the Foreign Office actually allow it to go ahead and without briefing him with a whole lot of nonsense about the historic Jewish capital being occupied Palestinian territory. Yeah, let's hope so, because that wouldn't go down, would it? Um, it wouldn't go down with, uh, uh, with the Israeli host, and it wouldn't go down with the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob either. Um, but also the other aspect I want to bring in, I, I think we've got about... I got my timings wrong, so we've got about three minutes left or so. Um, it, and that's the incredible cooperation between our nations now in, in terms of the Royal Air Force and the Israeli Air Force and, and the fact that we've seen um, the Royal Air Force uh, fly in mock operations with the Israeli Air Force over Israeli territory. We've had Israeli Air Force jets fly over British territory. Uh, and even the RAF took part in Israel's 75th anniversary with a flyby over Tel Aviv. We we know that there's incredible cooperation in terms of counterterrorism. Uh, there's cooperation as well in, in terms of um, uh, our military engagements of, of both armies and against terrorism and cyber terrorism as well. So this is an area that's really growing where, where Britain is really needing Israel's expertise. This, this is uh, absolutely right and, and it's very encouraging too. And I hope a change of government doesn't actually um, torpedo that if, if that happens um, but someone who's much more much more qualified to talk about the uh, military and intelligence cooperation would be uh, our good friend Colonel Richard Kemp but every time you try to get him on the program he's, he's always busy so it's very busy he's in Israel as we record this program yeah uh, what would you what do you I mean We've we, we <coughs> got to congratulate the British government because they are moving in the right directions when it comes to Israel about um, uh, outlawing the, the, the BDS uh, from councils, um, developing closer trade ties with Israel, military cooperation. Um, but we really need the British government also to become vocal instead of maybe hiding behind the scenes a little bit. Uh, is to be forthright in, in their support of Israel because we know that Israel doesn't have that complete support of uh, this current administration in the state. So we've come to the end mm. of the programme. Uh, Hugh, it's always a uh, pleasure to have you on the Middle East Report. You bring so much to the programme. And I want to thank you for watching at home. British-Israeli relations are so important and vital, and that's why we've got to continue to pray that the British government would stand with Israel and the Jewish people. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.